Welcome to lecture number 10. This is a bit of a transition in the class. We're going to spend some time doing a review of all of the topics that we've covered up to this point. Then we're going to do a brief introduction to analog to digital conversion. As you recall, we started with a discussion about information theory. From there, there was a whirlwind of terminology, which preceded analog radio. In fact, this is the section we're just finishing up now. We talked about AM radio, including things like single sideband and FM. The topic that we're transitioning to is digital radio. Once that's done, we'll move over to computer networks. Then we'll move on to some of the fun things such as antenna and radar and finally satellites. Of course, before we get to these topics, we have to have a better understanding of digital radio. Let's start our review by taking a look at the topics that are most likely on your note card. We'll start with number prefixes, such as tera, giga, mega, kilo, that's 10 to the 12th, 10 to the 9th, 10 to the 6th, 10 to the 3rd power. And then, of course, we can go the other side of the decimal point, milla, micro, nano, pico, and femto. There are some specific frequency bands that I've asked you to memorize, including voice, which is generally defined as 300 to 3000 hertz, not to be confused with the limits of human hearing, which, if you are still young and haven't damaged your ears, can go from about 20 hertz all the way up to 20,000. We spoke about the HF band which extends from 3 to 30 megahertz. The VHF, which is 30 to 300 megahertz. And the ultra high frequencies, which are 300 to about 3 gigahertz. Much later on in the class, we'll talk about microwaves, which are generally defined as 1 to about 30 gigahertz. And we'll even talk about optics a little bit. Lambda, which is the wavelength, is equal to the speed of light over the frequency, where C is equal to 300 times 10 to the 6th meters per second. Again, C is the speed of light. Knowing that frequency is 1 over time, and of course time is equal to 1 over frequency, we can rewrite our wavelength equation as the speed of light by the period of the waveform. We have spent a tremendous amount of time differentiating between the time domain and the frequency domain. In the time domain, we recognize a sinusoid with a given period and a given amplitude. When we walk to the frequency domain, that sinusoid becomes a single tone. It's just a spike in the frequency domain. If you're interested, a spike in the time domain, which is to say a burst of energy, like a bolt of lightning, walks over to the frequency domain as all frequencies, which is kind of an interesting concept. We spoke about the square wave in the time domain, and the fact that in the frequency domain, the square wave is represented as a summation, actually an infinite summation, 
of the odd harmonics. We even have an equation for the square wave. The voltage with respect to time is equal to an infinite series, starting at n equal 1, going to infinity, of 4 by the voltage of that square wave, divided by n by pi, sine of 2 pi f n t. That equation would tell us that this is the fundamental. This is 3 times the fundamental frequency, 5 times the fundamental, 7 by the fundamental, and so on to infinity. The amplitude of these waveforms, for example, this first one, the fundamental would be 4v over pi. The third harmonic would be 4v over 3 pi. The amplitude of the fifth harmonic, 4v over 5 pi. Again, that continues on. Let's make a little note here. N, where N is odd. The concept of bandwidth has been very important to us where we define bandwidth as some f2, which is the upper frequency, minus some lower frequency. So for example, if we have a wedge of frequencies in the frequency domain, this would be our f2, this would be our f1. Amplifiers were another topic. And attenuators. We identified amplifiers as triangles and attenuators were just drawn as resistors. The gain of an amplifier was typically represented by the letter A and mathematically described as the power out over the power in. Occasionally we would talk about the voltage gain, again with the letter A, except this time it's voltage out over voltage in. In dB form, gain is represented as 10 log base 10 of power out over power in, and occasionally we see gain is equal to 20 log base 10 of voltage out over voltage in. A typical example would have a cascade of amplifiers and attenuators. Let this be 5 linear, 1 half linear, and 5 again. We could talk about a total gain equal to 5 multiplied by 1 half multiplied by 5, which gives us 12.5. That same problem can be expressed in dB, where 5 becomes 6 dB. A reduction of half becomes negative 3 dB. And again, an increase of 5 is 6 dB. So we talk about a total gain equal to 6 minus 3 plus 6, which gives us 5 dB. We do like working with dB because the operations are either addition or subtraction. On a closely related note, we talked about power relative to a standard. A common measurement is dBm which is defined as 10 log of the power divided by 1 milliwatt. Again, that's power relative to a milliwatt. Of course, we're not restricted to dBm. We could even talk about something like dB femtowatts, in which case it would be 10 log base 10 of our power divided by 1 times 
10 to the negative 15. In the lab, we've explored filters. For example, this is a band pass and a notch. As you recall, we had a music track that had a band of noise in it. You used the notch filter to remove the noise. And in another part of the lab, you used the band pass filter so that you could look at just the noise, rejecting the music. Let's not forget the other types of filters, including the high pass and the low pass. So you have the band pass, the notch, or the band reject is another name for that, the high pass filter, and then the low pass filter. From there, we explored amplitude modulation. And you'll recall that came in three different, well, four different flavors. There was traditional AM, where we had the carrier and these wedges, known as the upper sideband and the lower sideband. Another form of AM modulation was double sideband suppressed carrier. So in this case, the carrier is no longer present. So this was conventional AM. This was double sideband suppressed carrier. Upper sideband. And of course, lower sideband. With regards to traditional AM modulation, we looked at a metric that would tell us how much or to which degree the signal was modulated. We described a voltage min and a voltage max that would describe the limits of the envelope. And we saw that the high frequency carrier was contained within that envelope. Our modulation index is equal to V min minus V max over V min plus V max. In the lab, we did explore the concept of mixers. For example, if we start with the microphone, there was a filter. We determined that this filter was very important for us because the filter determines the bandwidth. So bandwidth is equal to two by F sub M for traditional AM. Where of course this right here is the modulating frequency, otherwise known as the intelligence or the baseband signal. In the up conversion process, we take that intelligence and we mix it with our local oscillator, producing a double sideband suppressed carrier signal otherwise known as sums and differences. So the summation would be Fc plus F sub M, and the difference would be Fc minus F sub M. At this point, we have a decision to make. If we were to transmit conventional AM, we would inject the carrier. So now we would have Fc plus the sums and differences. Another option was to install a filter. For example, if you installed a bandpass filter and removed these low frequencies, you would be left with only the upper sideband wedge. The carrier would be absent as would the lower sideband because the lower sideband, of course, was filtered out Forgive me, I need to back up a bit. There's a topic we forgot. When we're exploring conventional AM modulation, the kind described by these equations, if the transmitter is 100% modulated, the power in the carrier is equal to two times the power in the sidebands. That's sidebands plural. Another way to say that is that power total is equal to the power in the carrier plus the power in the lower sideband 
plus the power in the upper sideband. If we assume a power in the carrier of 1, the lower sideband will have 1 quarter watt, and the upper sideband will have 1 quarter watt. Adding the upper and lower sideband, you can see where that 1 half came from. Let's look at this number again, just to make sure I haven't written it wrong. If we're dealing with AM, traditional AM, the bandwidth will be 2 by the modulating frequency. If we're dealing with double sideband, suppressed carrier, the bandwidth will be 2 by F sub M. For lower sideband, the bandwidth is equal to F sub M. And for the upper sideband, the bandwidth is also equal to F sub M. We've mentioned this many times that this filter right here, this voice filter, plays a very important part because it is this filter which determines the maximum modulating frequency, which in turn determines the bandwidth. FM was described as a voltage control oscillator with this axis being the voltage input and this axis being frequency deviation. There's a linear relationship between these two. For example, if the voltage in is zero, the frequency of the carrier might be 100 megahertz. As the voltage in varies in either direction, we can see that the frequency of the carrier will go up and down. You could think of that as a siren or a penny whistle. The amount of modulation is called the modulation index. M sub F is equal to the frequency deviation divided by the modulating frequency. With one stipulation, we'll arrive at the deviation ratio. It's the same equation. The only difference is that we're describing the maximum deviation divided by the maximum frequency that you're modulating at. Once the deviation ratio is known, we can use Bessel functions to determine the number of significant sideband pairs. For example, in the frequency domain, we might have a carrier, a first sideband pair at FC plus F sub M, and FC minus F sub M. Then there'll be another sideband pair at the frequency of the carrier minus 2 F sub M. And here, the upper one would be the frequency of the carrier plus 2 F sub M. We continue this, capturing all of the sideband pairs, again, determined by the deviation ratio. The bandwidth of that FM transmission is defined as 2 by the modulating frequency by N, where N is the number of significant sideband pairs. The bandwidth can also be calculated using Carson's rule, where bandwidth is 2 by the maximum deviation plus the maximum modulating frequency. That takes care of our traditional modulation methods. Now we shift gears and we start working towards digital methods. To do that, we need to know a little bit about number systems. And an exercise I like to do is work back and forth between arbitrary bases. For example, the number 324 in base 5 can be converted to decimal. To do this, we use what's called the expanded form. So we can rewrite this number as 3 by 5 squared plus 2 by 5 to the first power plus 4 times 5 to the 0 power. We would identify this 
5 here as the 1's place, this as the 5's, and this here as the 25's. So you could say we have 3 25's, 2 5's, and 4 1's. On quizzes and exams, you'll see this referred to as expanded form. Which is good, because once you have things in expanded form, it's very easy to convert to decimal. For example, 3 times 5 squared is 75, 2 times 5 is 10, and then 4 times 1 is 4, which tells us that 324 base 5 is equal to 89 base 10. Of course, once you're here, you're going to want to go the opposite direction. And we'll use a technique called the subtraction method. To do that, start by capturing your places. Let this be the 1's place, the 5's place, and the 25's place. Write the number here, this to be converted. And then ask yourself, how many times will 25 go into 89? The answer is 3 times, so what 3 goes here in the table, with the remainder of 14. How many times will 5 go into 14? The answer is twice, with a remainder of 4. How many times will 1 go into 4? Of course, the answer is 4, with 0 remainder. With that done, we can say 89 base 10 is equal to 324 base 5. Did we mention a note card converter that looks something like this? Our first column is the decimal numbers from 0 to 15. The next column is binary. With four bits, the number zero becomes zero, 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 zero. One becomes zero, 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 one, and two becomes zero, zero, one, zero. You might notice a pattern. For example, in the ones column, it alternates between zero and one. To quickly fill out the card, we can just follow that pattern. So 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. The 2's column goes 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. The 4's column is 4 zeros, then 4 1's, 4 zeros, and 4 1's. The 8's column is 8 zeros, Be sure to add a hex column. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Keep in mind that hex is base 16, so you couldn't put 10 here. That would not work because that's two symbols. Keep in mind that hex is base 16, which means we need 16 unique symbols. For convenience, we'll finish this off using the symbols A through F. This note card converter is very handy when we're converting between binary and hex, or hex to binary. For example, let's assume this number is right justified, which means our least significant bit is here and our most significant bit is here. We start by looking this number up in the table, and right there it is, that's a five. One zero zero one is a nine. One one zero one is a D, and then one and one. So this long base two number becomes one one D nine in hex, which is often represented as 0x11d95.
you may be asked to calculate the number of unique items that may be represented by digits. Some of those are quite easy. For example, if you had two decimal digits, not decimals base 10, you could represent the lowest number as 0, 0, base 10, is less than or equal to n is less than or equal to 99, base 10. So with two digits, you can count from 0 to 99. But what if you had two binary digits? With binary, you could go from 0, 0, base 2, would be less than or equal to n, is less than or equal to 1, 1, base 2. If we were to convert that to base 10, that would be 0 is less than or equal to n, is less than or equal to 3. What if we had three binary digits? Well, with three digits, we're asking three questions, aren't we? We go from 0, 0, 0, base 2, is less than or equal to n, is less than or equal to 1, 1, 1, base 2. And that should make sense if we follow this tree. This number would be 0, 0, 0, going all the way up to 1, 1, 1. If we were to generalize this, we would say that 0 is less than or equal to n is less than or equal to the base raised to the power of d minus 1, where b is the base and d is the number of digits. So in this case, 0 is less than or equal to n is less than or equal to 2 raised to the third power minus 1. So 0 is less than or equal to n is less than or equal to 7. Here's another example. What if you had three hex digits? 0, 0, 0, base 16 is less than or equal to n is less than or equal to f, f, f. And if we were to convert that or just use the equation, we would say 0 is less than or equal to n is less than or equal to 16 to the third power minus 1, which tells us that we can have numbers from 0 to 4095. I should point out that this is only one of several methods used to store numbers on the computer. This method is for positive integers. Someday in the future we might talk about two's complement, which would allow negative numbers, and something called floating point which would allow numbers with decimal points. At one point we mentioned IP addresses. For example, your computer might have an IP address of 192.168.1.8. This is known as dotted decimal notation. Here there are four fields where each field is separated by that decimal point. Let's go ahead and convert each field to its equivalent binary. We'll start with the number 192, and we may as well use the divide by 2 method to solve that. 96, remainder 0, 48, remainder 0, 24, remainder 0, 12 remainder 0, 6 remainder 0, 3 remainder 0, 1 remainder 1, and 0 remainder 1. If we collect our terms in this direction, we see that 192 becomes 11000000. That takes care of the first field. Now let's work on the second field, so 168. Our opening move is to divide that by 2, so that's 84, the remainder of 0, 42, remainder of 0, 21, remainder of 0, 
10, remainder 1, 5, remainder 0, 2, remainder 1, 1, remainder 0, and finally, 0, remainder 1. 168 base 10 is 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. That takes care of the second field. Fields 3 and 4 are fairly trivial. So we can come down here and we can write our IP address in binary. 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. That takes care of that. Decimal. That takes care of that. I believe the next one was the number 1. And then finally, 8. So there you have it. 192.168.1, decimal 8. By the way, how many unique IP addresses can you have? That's something we can do. 0 is less than or equal to n is less than or equal to 2 raised to the 32nd power minus 1. Why 32? Because there are 32 bits in this dotted decimal notation, which gives us a very large number of IP addresses. You can see that that decision tree expands very rapidly. With one question, there are two possibilities. With two questions, there are four. With three questions, eight and then 16. And before you know it, you're up to 4 billion. With this concept in mind, let's move on to the analog to digital converter. To get started, let's consider a water tank. Let's assume we installed a sensor in the side of the tank. With one sensor, we effectively split that tank into two. We can describe it as half full or half empty. So we're going to split the tank or describe how many sections there are. And of course, let's not lose track of how much information we're obtaining with that sensor. So one sensor, we split the tank in two. We talk about an upper half and we talk about a lower half. As for information, that sensor will tell you if the level is in the upper half of the tank or in the lower half of the tank. One question is asked. Let's add some more sensors. We'll put one here and here. Now there are three sensors and the tank is split into four sections. There's one, two, three, or four. How much information is there? Well, there's two bits of information contained in that. Because with two bits, you can identify four unique things. If we add more sensors, we now have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven sensors. The tank is split effectively eight ways. There are now three bits of information associated with that. And if we further subdivided it by adding more sensors, there are now 15 sensors, which effectively divide the tank into 16 sections. But there are only four bits of information associated with that. And I won't draw it, but you could imagine we could keep going forever with this. So if there are 31 sensors, we could split that tank into 32 sections and describe that with five bits of information, where information is the number of questions you had to ask to determine the tank level. For example, one question, is it above or below that line? Two questions, is it above or below that line? Three questions, is it above or below this line? And then four questions, is it above or below this line? With that series of questions, you can very quickly determine the tank level. If we were to put that information on a graph, it would look something like this. 
our first split or our first sensor would be at the five foot mark. Our next two sensors would be at 2.5 and 7.5. With four sensors, we subdivide again. It's 1.25, 3.75, 6.25, and 8.75. With additional sensors, we subdivide yet again. So all those sensors give us something that looks like this with our 10-foot tank. There are 16 unique things to talk about. Assuming zero is identified as the first item, we go all the way to 15. But why stop there? We may as well convert this into binary. Which brings us right back to where we started, where 0 is less than or equal to n is less than or equal to 15. Or, if you prefer, in binary, 0 is less than or equal to n is less than or equal to 2 raised to the fourth minus 1. Because this is a 4-bit system. That's what we said, right? There are 4 bits of information contained within this graph. The big picture takeaway of all this is that information, that series of yes, no questions that you asked, can be used to determine the tank level. For example, if I told you the tank level was 1011, that's four questions. That's four binary pieces of information that identify this line. You know based on the design of this system, you know that the water level is somewhere between 6.875 and 7.5. You don't know exactly where it is, but you know it's between those two lines. By the way, the distance between those two lines is known as the resolution or the ambiguity of the system. We can calculate that number by saying this is a 10-foot tank, which is described as 16 unique levels, with 0 being one of those levels, which yields 0 0.625 feet, which is indeed this distance right here, the smallest distance that can be measured. Suppose this number isn't good enough, and you want to be able to measure smaller changes in that water level. We could certainly add more sensors to the side of the tank, although that gets somewhat tedious. Instead, we could install an ultrasonic sensor, which sends out a signal that is reflected off the water. That reflection then tells the sensor what the tank level is. The output of this tank level indicating sensor might head off to a computer, such as a programmable logic controller. So we'll call this a tank level indicator. Let's assume that this is an 8-bit system. If it's an 8-bit system, we have 10 feet divided by 2 to the 8th, which gives us a resolution of 10 divided by 256, of 0 0.0391 feet. Graphically, that means the tank goes from 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, all the way up to 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, with a resolution, right? The smallest increment that it can measure as 0 0.0391 feet. Think of this as a mapping operation, where 0 corresponds with that digital number, and 10 minus 0 0.0391 corresponds with that number. Being mindful of units, we have feet, 
feet. And I didn't mention this, but we have time on this axis. For example, if we fill the tank, we can see that the water level increases linearly with time. As the water is consumed, we might see it drop, and then later we might fill it again. Now here's a question for you. How often do we need to measure this tank level? Do we need to know or do we need to have an update once every millisecond? Probably not. Do we need an update once an hour? Well, that's probably too slow. But once a minute might be okay. So maybe we'll take samples every place that I've drawn a dot here. That would probably be acceptable. This time between dots is called the sampling period. Of course, if we have a sample period, we could also, with a little bit of work, determine the sampling frequency, which means F sub S is equal to 1 over the sample period. It took us forever to get there, but this mapping process we've been talking about is known as analog to digital conversion. We have effectively split a signal by time and we've binned it according to amplitude. These operations together are captured in this symbol known as the analog to digital converter. We start with some sensor out here. We have a control line here that takes in the sampling frequency. And we have an output. In this case, let it be 8 bits. The ADC is analog on this side and digital on this side. That grid we were talking about earlier in this direction is determined by the resolution of the ADC. It's a question of how many bits, right? How many times did we split the voltage? The binning in this direction is determined by the sample frequency. How many times do we ask a question every second? In fact, let's write that down. Let's talk about the analog to digital converter specifications. We are very interested in a sampling frequency. We are interested in the resolution, which you could interpret as simply the bits. In this case, we had an 8-bit machine. We're also interested in the voltage input or the full-scale voltage. As you can imagine, there's way more to the specification than these three things, but that'll get us going for now. By the way, if we have an ADC, we have to have a way of converting back to analog, and that's known as the DAC, the DAC. Analog to digital converter, digital to analog converter. You'll find the DAC has the same general specifications as the ADC. There's a sampling frequency, there's a resolution in bits, and there is a full-scale output voltage that's specified. To put all this in perspective, consider this example. There is a digital to analog converter in your CD player. The sampling frequency of the CD player is typically 44,100 hertz, and it has a bit depth of 16 bits. Let's calculate the number of bits required for a five-minute song. Using dimensional analysis, we start with five minutes. There are 60 seconds per minute. There are 44,100 samples per 
second. And finally, there are 16 bits per sample. Push that through your calculator. I think you'll find about 212 million bits. And if we assume stereo, we're now in the 400 million bit range. As far as the hardware is concerned, there are two DACs, followed by amplifiers. The DACs would share a common signal source for the sampling frequency. The way this works is that 44,100 times per second, which we would call samples per second, each DAC must be fed 16 bits from the CD machinery. So you could say every tick, every tick, 32 bits are consumed, and there are 44,100 ticks per second. Next time we'll meet, we're going to start with our comms model with a few modifications. On this side, we have an analog signal. Our voice filter now has a new name. We're going to call it the anti-aliasing filter. There will be a sampling frequency, which will be very important to us. There will be a certain number of bits associated with that analog to digital converter. And our modulators are going to get very interesting. Our new digital modulators will go by names such as amplitude shift keying, frequency shift keying, phase shift keying, and then the real fun ones are quadrature amplitude modulation.